This story is about a family who've turned the clock back a hundred years in order to protect the values they cherish from a society they feel is destroying man's individuality. They may not be unique, but they are determined. And in order to survive, they've chosen to live in the style of the early pioneers. We were able to share some of their thoughts, hopes, experiences and achievements whilst filming over a period of 15 months. I feel we uh, have got to get away from our present society, from our civilization, from everything what's happening now because it's going down the drain. Uh, it has lost its, its strength, it has lost the values. We are manipulated by science and by achievements, by uh, progress, and we are not human anymore. In 1964, Tim Voss came from Holland to New Zealand to be free. He spent the first seven years in Christchurch with his wife Joss, a growing number of children, some sheep, goats, fowls and various other creatures, trying to live an alternative lifestyle in a suburban setting. The conflict with his environment was too much. So in 1971, inspired by a dream, he came to the remote west coast of the South Island to live out his philosophy. His freedom and his future depend to a large extent on the very ground he walks over, the Spencer's Road, a route once knitting five farms together and allowing carts to take produce ten miles or so to the one-time port of Little Whanganui. In many places now, heavy bush regrowth shrouds the path from sight for birds and the airborne deer hunter in some of the most rugged country in New Zealand, an area that takes its name from the boulders at its edges, the Kongahu, or Stony Land. In its time, the terrain has known gold mining, timber milling, farming, havoc from a traumatic earthquake in 1929, and abandonment. And the once vital road became forgotten. But because of the dream which had led him to the region, searching for a place to settle, Tim Voss rediscovered it. His dream was unfolding when a man told him how he'd seen some land from the air that might suit his needs, down the coast at the far end of the Kongahu. Without even seeing it himself, the determined Dutchman found the owner and got permission to squat there with his family, his sheep, his goats and so on. But first he had to get there. At that time, the only locally known access to anywhere in the Kongahu was along the coastline from Little Whanganui. Over ankle-wrenching boulders washed by the Tasman Sea and picketed by its tides. Some farmers had risked taking their animals to and from pasture along this course and lost some in the process. Tim Voss decided it was too hazardous a way for his young caravan. There had to be another way in. And for three months he searched, surveying, climbing the hills and trying to make his way down the creek bed in an effort to penetrate the area, looking for trails. But each time he had to turn back. And then his luck changed. He found on an old map that there had been a way years ago, a public road that wound through the Kongahu south from Little Whanganui. The Spencer's Road was rediscovered. I saw the great gift of it. Then my mind went berserk. I was raving about, I said, 
my, here is the highway. And that uh, it was struggling through mud and under all this undergrowth and it took you the, it took you almost two days to come back and forth along that road and in many places you got lost in the bush and never find a way back and you had to stay out there that bad it was but still i had this it blew my mind and i was saying that's going to be the Vos avenue <laughs> in fact the avenue didn't lead him to the exact piece of land he'd been seeking later though it was to show the way to other land and because of his conviction that he was guided into the whole situation by his maker, the road has become the very spine of his existence. Bringing the family out of the old into the new life they sought. The map showed that the old trail started here in Corby Vale, now split in half by the West Coast Highway, which skirts the whole Kongahoo. And it's here that the family came with their belongings and set up camp. When they found it, the former staging post and homestead had been abandoned for some 15 years and was derelict and crowded in with trees. But it was still more secure than a tent, and a benevolent farmer allowed them to squat here to follow their quest. With none of the trappings of modern society and little security, they could be asked to leave any time. Their real security, though, was the road and the forest land around it. Meantime, they had shelter and a base to rest in and work from. Now, it houses the warmth of the heart of the family. But when they moved in, they had possums in the attic, cows strolling through, no windows, a leaking roof and an old stove rotting away in the middle. They shaped it to their needs. Apart from their animals, their tools and their furniture, they also brought a drum of molasses, a few tins of honey, some pumpkins and two sacks of wheat, their staple food, as the children well know. Grinding wheat is only one of the many chores necessary to keep the lifestyle going. Chores that grandmothers may just remember, but that Joab, their youngest son, will learn to recognize as routine. And he's wise to build up now because to relive the simple life of our forebears can be pretty tough. It's not tough because you've got no tensions with other people got in town. You can do everything what you want to do in a relaxed way. And... Um, it was just only making the decision if you want it or not. And we made that decision already in town because we felt it was too much. We, we were not living ourselves, but other people, they lived us. You feel that you, you, you stop grinding now and put it in the, bu in the box there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Put it in the box. Yeah. That's enough. No, you don't need to grind anymore. That's enough. Put the box away. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I think we still got some of commitments with the children. And that's for, for me is a very difficult thing, it's the schooling, because that is always that you've got to do every day again. And that takes so much time, that is, that's, I shouldn't say a burden, because other people, they, they, they feel they miss out on education and they like to have the children to the top, but we are just going the other way. Under the hair, if you didn't see him before, is first of all Reuben, and he'd be about 11 now. Then comes Joachim, who's nine and puts everything in his mouth. Nataniela, or Tala, as she's more usually called. She's eight and full of love. This is Daniel, who's not too keen on school learning and can't wait to be a man, unless there's sweets around. He's 15. Joella must be around 14, and she's one of those rarities. She really enjoys studying. And Kester, and I'm not so sure he likes schoolwork too much. But then he's only seven. Correspondence schooling is perfect, it's good. Of course, I like my children to be able to read and express themselves on paper. I think that is what Tim can do, I can do it. But Tim, and that's what I would like for my children too. And that they, after that, when they can read, that they sort of educate themselves with our help, we, we guide them. But uh, I think... Well, for me, that would be enough. Oh! 
Here, take it out, Matanya. Look first. Take it out. Take it outside. Oh, sorry. Correspondence school oh, may sorry. be good, but on fine days, the children would no doubt far rather join the goat outside where their real education is gained, reveling in their surroundings. Yes, they've got running water in Corby Vale, cold running water, even in summer. But the neighbouring creek is a blessing in many ways. It provides all their drinking water. A place for those very private moments when one has to attend to one's personal hygiene. Not helped one bit by a little sister. A supplier along its banks of watercress, another of their staple foods. And the scene for the biggest operation of all, the family wash. If the creek is important to their life, so too is the wood that fuels the boiler, heats their stove and feeds their fires. And as each year has passed, Tim has had to go further and further away from the house to get it, clearing more and more of the farmer's paddock for him as he does so. But he has no choice. He refuses to use either petrol or electricity in his daily life. We would, by using petrol and electricity, we would be straight away back into the red race. We have made a break, mm -hmm. but all the easy things, all the conveniences, they are so readily available that it's a constant struggle to keep free of them. It's a threat all the time to being drawn back into 
these conveniences. The only way of coping with it is having a direction, a, a directional thought, and that's the that's the insane part of our existence. Our view, our vision is in the opposite direction. We are looking back to the time past and we are living that time vigorously. for this meal and I'm so pleased that we've got whatever we need. I thank you for the roof on our head and I'm pleased Jesus that we are fed and cared for and we're a bit tired, we have worked and we have done our thing and that we've got this food right here and you care for us through the night and we ask you our blessing. Thank you very much, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tonight, there's a little extra on the table to complement the home-baked bread and the watercress. The hens have done their job, and there's honey from the few bees Tim keeps. Sometimes, Joss produces an amazing stew, seemingly from nothing, but full of all kinds of things you don't ask about, you just enjoy. It hasn't always been so, though. There have been times when they've really had to scratch around to make a meal. We didn't get hungry, but we came to stages that we ate the same food as the goats at ate. <laughs> there is a time here that even the creeks run out of watercress. That is our, we have been eating possum meat and the greens was the uh, watercress. And then came the time, even in winter time, that we just grind in the meat mincer, whatever shoot broadly, and whatever young shoots the, the goats were eating. And so I may say we never got hungry because it's the best food there is. It's very healthy food, but well, we had to chew on it and it was... And the children, they liked it. The children, they liked it. The children, they adapt very easily to this sort of life. Any romantic notions about dropping out would be sorely tested on the West Coast especially in Corby Vale. You can be sure not every morning is cock bright and sunny. In fact, this little valley has the heaviest rainfall in the country, enough to dampen the spirits and actions of the most resolute at times. But even the weather won't hold up today's proceedings. Feeding a large family from your own resources can be hard. It can be harder still sometimes to feed the many animals about the place. This morning, though, there's a bonus. An ailing calf belonging to a neighbouring farmer was put out of its misery at dawn by Tim Voss's bullet. And that means dog tucker.
I bet these two reckon all the effort's been well worthwhile. And they certainly don't complain when Daniel's been successful with his traps. Not too bad. Two possums and a rat. Dan's not complaining either. The skins bring good pocket money towards a rifle, maybe, or even a horse of his own. And the dogs get their meat. There are times when the veggie eaters need a change of diet, too. When the little patch of land around the house can scarcely support the field mice, let alone black sheep, Nancy, Ramsey, Jemina, Makahipi, Kala, Koha, Bunny, and Sunset. So it's up the Spencer's Road for a bit of exercise and a feed. Year by year, the road has become a more and more important element in Tim Voss's life. The inspiration for his hopes and the future supplier of his needs. So whenever he can, he comes to it. And unasked and unpaid, he works to restore and maintain it against the ravages of the climate, building bridges over the creeks. And following the old timer's style of corduroying with punga trunks to stabilize the rich mud that drains onto it. A mile and a half or so along is one of the reasons for his dedication. The road borders 90 acres of mostly trapped swamp and bush, some of the crown land he's been granted grazing rights to. He'd like some land like this, open to the sun and wind, but others have it under lease, even if they don't use it. Tim has hopes, though, that maybe someday... God has guided us to this place. And in our human limitations, we thought this was the very place. But I rather feel now that our fantasies were not big enough to encompass that why shouldn't we include this whole place? Why shouldn't we live in this whole area? This is the land I ever dreamed of. And right in the heart of it, seven miles from his present base, lies the piece of land he dreamed of most. Another hundred acres he'd been granted grazing rights to and where he hoped to settle his family and create his own environment and culture. That's where, for Tim, the road really led. And that, when I first met him, was his main objective. Initially, it was his intention to make a way through as soon as possible. At first for the sheep and goats, and eventually to have a track good enough for a cart to travel over. A monumental task for anyone, especially one who shuns using anything more modern than an axe, a cross saw on his sweat. But with his eldest son, he persisted, inching away slowly but surely along the road. Meanwhile, as season followed season, the temporary base at Corbyvale was becoming more and more established. And in many ways, they were already enjoying the very lifestyle they'd always sought.
But the more progress they made on the road, the more ambitious and sophisticated became the effort required of them, and the more time the whole project demanded. You could cut this stick for me, yeah? With three miles still to go, the compulsion to finish the road and establish his settlement in the Kongahu came into conflict with the feeling that he was neglecting many tasks back in the valley. The dilemma disturbed his peace and made war in Tim's soul. The weather didn't help much either. Often their work would be ruined by unsympathetic storms, bringing slips, washouts and even more trees down where they'd cleared. There was always the possibility too that if other leaseholders took up their land and used the road to bring their cattle along, it would become a quagmire in no time. So after months and months of toil, Tim was caught between two worlds. The vision that brought him here, and which, because of the road, seemed to guide him further and further away from the old life and society, and the reality that whilst he still lived in the valley on the edge of society, he had to tailor his life to fit his needs there too. The constant need for wood, the need to clear land now for grazing and eventually to sow his own crops. And the need to do what he likes above all, to create the right environment for his family and be with them. It was a time then for the family to change tack, for a while anyway. The other three miles of road will be finished in the future, maybe if and when they need extra land for grazing, or maybe when the sons grow up and become independent and want their own land. Tim had hoped that others would join them and that one day the road would be the link between people with like ideals that would live along its sides and share a common culture. Certainly Daniel has his eye on that land at the back and would be happy to set his traps and shoot deer there. But just keeping up the parts of the road already cleared would be a continual task and there are other things calling. One project in particular that the family's been looking forward to and which again could very much affect their life in the valley. About four years ago the little homestead felt the full force of a cyclone. It ripped off parts of the roof, collapsed the surrounding veranda, and tearing up the ground from under them, threw the majestic cypresses across the homemade A-frame. It was a night of terror, but ever since, Tim's planned to make something positive from the chaos. From the wind-smitten trees, he intends to make a windmill, to harness the very power that smote them down, and to serve the family by cutting the wood and grinding the wheat. And today's the big day to make a start. First, though, they have to get the trees back upright. Danneke, als jij dat touw uitlegt en dubbel het, als je het... Ja, je tekent wel eens een end op het wel. Dat is draai, Daniel. 
Can we try? Hey. Yeah. Can we try? Go on. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, you tied that on, you? Oh, yeah. You know what a knot you've got to make? No. <laughs> Yeah, I made the strongest monkey in the world. You, you call that a bowline, right? Yep, bowline. Can you make a bowline? Yep. No. Okay. okay. All right, you try it like this. Come on. Uh, we all poke him. Yeah. That's why you can't use spin. Ah, uh, just see how, how it comes. Otherwise, you call out Josh and me. Oh, we manage. Come on, pull. Aye. Come on. Aye. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> Come on, cast the hull. Oh, yeah, hold your eyes, man. Vraag maar of je wel ook mee komt. And I rain came too. <laughs> no, I rain. Hey, Daniel, that's very action. Eddie, you want me? Come on, always pull a bit, eh? Pull cool anywhere. Hey, wait. Now they have to get them down. Unfortunately, shortly after his mighty effort with the trees, Danable the Bullock and another ox Tim owned went bush and were shot by deer hunters. So, Joella's pet pony, Blackie, has the job of bringing in the wood. But help is on the way. At the time, the family was planning to have a couple of shire horses to join in the work. Tree stumping, bringing shingle to the road, and pulling the cart with wood for the new windmill.
There could, of course, be only one site for this windmill. That's right, on the Spencer's Road, between the house and the first piece of Tim's grazing land. Can you pull already, yours? Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh oh. Hold it there, hold it there. Hold it there. No, but let's go, let's go, anyway. Let's go, anyway. Let me tell you, can you pull? Jolt, swing. And back in. You grab that yellow rope at the back. Yeah, hold it, hold it. Then pull, pull. And just keep a bit tension on it, yes? And keep a bit tension on that rope. That's beauty. Oh! 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 Did it wrong! Yeah! But this is all the way round! Pull it down, pull it down. Down. Why? Down. Down. Yeah, I like to climb it. Wat zie je? Oh, geweldig, joh. Ja, ik zie je. Ik heb hem te groot. Ja, daar. Oh, het is een monster. Daar meer. Oh, zie je weer. Oh, Have a look at her. Is that beautiful? Glorious. Oh, yes. Glorious. I think I'm a rich man. Yes, you are. You're a rich man, Glorious. Now, you hold up there. Hey, you hold up there. Please. Yeah, you may hold it for a while there. Yeah. Yeah, a bit more slack, Daniel. Slack, slack. There you are. The big wings on it, there's not enough room. Oh, <laughs> no, it's not going to stay like this. I know, but, um... How are you going to get it up there? That's okay. right, Tim. Let's, let's try how it... Uh, let's try how it... In. Now hold it, Daniel. Don't let it come down again, eh? Oh boy, that one is heavier, I reckon. Yeah, pull, Daniel. Can you hold it there? Yeah. I'd tie some rope around it first. Why? Seven. You'll get your firewood. Oh, Progress is always horrible. Oh, oh careful. Whoopee. <laughs> Give it a spin, Tim. Oh, it's beautiful. It runs all right. Glory. Away you go. Get the arms on then. All right. We want to show some wood. How is that? Glory! Oh, yeah. <laughs> now to prepare for its future. With the windmill well underway, Tim could now turn his attention to the land he leased nearest his base. This would be transformed into a paddock for the animals at first and later to grow his own food. And in the meantime, it would provide more than enough fuel for the sawmill being prepared. In fact, there should be enough firewood to see even Daniel through life. Ninety acres to clear by hand and cultivate, a house to squat in, and a windmill on a public road to power your saw and grind your wheat. It may not be the intellectual's idea, but it's certainly a positive form of protest. As the need for grazing land grew greater and the interruptions from callers by interfered with their work, the family decided to move en masse up the road, onto the site, to camp for a while and gain the most of the daylight.
Away from the house doesn't necessarily mean away from the chores, though. The daily bread still has to be made. In the light, eh? At last, a new member of the family arrives, Ben, a stand-in for the two draft horses on order. He may not be exactly Blackie's idea of the virile young companion who would come and relieve her of the heavy workload, but he's a very experienced old chap, prepared to help as much as he can, I'm sure, just as soon as he adapts to the situation and if and when he gets over his shyness with the little lady. Come on. Get acquainted, eh? Here. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to see her, no. <coughs> you reckon that lady is not good enough for you? Come on, go. Make acquaintance. Say to me. Hey, come. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Hey, come on. She's not good enough for you. No. Ah. 
tell you what. It's about time that you appreciate a good red horse like her. Oh, oh, come on. That's not much hope for the future, I tell you that. And here's another little relationship that doesn't seem to be getting off to too good a start. It's <laughs> more than that, uh, Robin. Jackie. Hit them, yeah. I'll get through this through and then you... Yeah. By now, the windmill had reached the critical stage of fitting the wings for the sail yeah, vanes. These have to be pulled to exactly the right shape with fencing wire and calculated, like the whole structure, by faith and rule of thumb. And it works. Down the road, the grazing land, once bush, is changing dramatically. Cleared, in Tim's words, selectively, leaving the young trees and giving a park-like appearance. Whoa, Ben. Whoa, Ben. Stand up now. There's good boy. Old Ben has settled in and on the job, lending his weight and experience to the project and growing in confidence in his new surroundings. And so too is Joab. But there's always one kid who'll try to undermine it. He's not quite so put out by it this time. Maybe he's becoming philosophical about their relationship. Or maybe it's because he knows there's a big sister close to hand, just in case. He's still not too certain. These are more his style. They don't rear up at you, especially if you're well-armed. About nine months after the trees went down, she was finished, needing only her sails and a friendly wind. And if the wind that comes is unfriendly and blows it down, then Tim says he'll build it up again and again if need be. dying, smothered in its own wealth and produce, and starving because of the exhausted resources. But a new generation, only a few, will survive and bear fruit. We are on the threshold of a new world, a fresh start, a new beginning. Some of the hippies, alternative people, freaks, rebels, will survive, and we hope to be one of them.